there are people, that, um, you know, Emily's List has my favorite diagram on this. Um, so does the, the National Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund of how a grassroots candidate can fund a campaign. And it's these concentric circles of people that you know. It starts with your friends and family, it then builds up to your neighbors and coworkers, it builds up to people you went to college with, people you go to church with. And it, it's, it is very formulaic, actually. It feels like this big, scary thing to do. And it, and it, it certainly is, um, but it is also very formulaic. And, you know, I do a certain number of hours of call time each week that I know will generate enough money to cover a campaign staff. And, and you, you know, frankly, you just do it. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, right now there are more millionaires in the United States that self-identify as Democrats than Republicans. You know, I, I called somebody the other day in Southern California who lived in a place that had every single right that I will ever fight for. And when I called her and asked her for money, she didn't have any money to give to anybody around her because she has everything that she could ever need in her hometown. So she donated some money to a state representative 3,015 miles away. It, it is doable, right? And, and if it was ever, you know, maybe if there were ever a better time, it's, it's now. This entire country is really ticked off of what we allowed to happen. And people are, are looking to um, have their dollars follow their values. Can I just add one quick thing? Um, we, we had a, a meeting in someone's living room. I'm a big proponent of living rooms. Um, and uh, it was, happened to be we invited the state rep, John Holland, who was part of the caucus, um, to, because it was taking place in her district. There were 28 women there, one man, um, from millennials to boomers. And by the time, and, and I was mostly there to talk about the campaign um, and the Women's Law Project. It was a little bit of a fundraiser. By the time the evening was over, three people were going to run to be committee people. So it depends on what you're running for, too. It may not be their offices, but boy, that's certainly in Philly. Committee people have a lot of sway if you want influence. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and certainly where I started, um, uh, you know, it, there are lots of different ways of being involved. And you get elected as a committee person, at least in Philadelphia. I don't know what it's like around the rest of the state. So, you know, I think there are other ways of getting involved in politics that are really essential that aren't quite as glamorous. So I um, urge people, it was a very exciting outcome of our project, I'll tell you. One more thought, please. Um, we have a whole page of the Invisible Burks website devoted to running for office. Um, it's got lots of, um, lots of tools, lots of links to, to, um, to other websites that help you figure out how to do it. It also has links to um, special funds for women candidates and for um, young people. So, you fit in other of those categories. There are there's special opportunities um, for you. I just have to give a shout out to my own state representative, Mark Gillen, from the 128. I see you back there. Thank you so much.
Don't ask me for any money. I have very little. My campaign expense account right now. Uh, but uh, certainly, your passion on the issues you're getting out in the community. If you would look at the community calendar and find out how many events there are, you'd be shocked at the places you could go, where you could show up, and give your little spiel there. So there's no substitute for pressing the flesh. It can be done on a de minimis amount of dollars if you're willing to drop the sweat. Apologize when I've been here earlier. Um, I'm in my farmer clothes. We had an alpaca born out on our farm just about an hour ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to follow up on something that uh, Judy mentioned in the beginning and didn't follow through on because you were saving time, I guess. Uh, but for Judy and Brian especially, uh, you had talked, Judy, about what it is that makes for effective citizen lobbying from your viewpoint. What, what is it basically that you listen to? What gets through to you? What gets read? What gets kind of tossed in the pile? And I thought that would be uh, probably very interesting for a lot of folks here to hear. And maybe even if anybody else wants to get in on that from the other side, what they have done that has not listened to. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Randy, for to follow up on that. For me, I can only speak for my son, okay? I read every handwritten, hand-typed letter. I don't see every email. For reasons, it's just impossible to do that. But my staff does. And so we look at those, we aggregate them. I'll tell you what we don't read and what we put in the stacks, like I said to you. Do you remember when we started talking about liquor reform and Sheets wanted to sell beer, right? So Sheets had at every counter a little postcard that said, free the beer, beautiful, colorful uh, postcard. We got hundreds, maybe thousands of those. We counted them, put them into the stack, but the letters and the conversations that I had from individuals who had concerns about what liquor reform would look like in Pennsylvania, and not just in Pennsylvania, but my district. And it's, you know, it's so interesting because we've got a diverse, Diversity in terms of Brian and myself, not just that way, Brian. But also, <laughs> also from the standpoint of being in Philadelphia and being in Reading, are very, very different experiences. So, you know, here it's much more conservative. People are, you know, they're, they're concerned about issues like that. We have communities that still do not even have a bar, that they are not, you know, they're dry. So, we really try to find out what our constituents I've always, you know, when we're, when we're up in the Senate and we're, um, you know, working on a vote, our leaders, a lot of people think that the leaders say to you, you have to vote this particular way. You know what my leader says to me, Jay Cost, he says, Judy, you can't do this one. You always do what your district tells you to do. Vote your district rather than trying to vote a particular party line. And that, that is what has, has worked for me. So from the standpoint of what we look at, those personal visits, the people who call and politely offer, you know, an opinion or whatever it may be, those are the kinds of things that we sit down and before the votes, and it's not just the big ones, but it's all of them, that we sit down and talk about, you know, which way should, you know, which way are my, my constituents leaning? Which way should I vote on this particular bill? And that has always proven to be really helpful for and the other piece of advice, wisdom that I've gotten from some other politicians is that, you know, every vote that you make, you better be able to defend it. You, it's the, you made the vote, you better be able to say, this is why I did that, and be able to stand up and talk about why, you know, what your research was in, in making that particular decision. So that advice has held me in good stead. Um, I would ask you, you know, if you're going to call or contact us, um, make it personal. Tell me a story rather than just printing something that's in a form letter and sending it off. Really, although we count them, I'm not saying we don't count them, but when I say to you that I read letters, personal letters, it makes a huge difference in how I vote. And don't also forget to make a personal kind of connection <coughs> with the legislature. You've got, you know, a guy like Mark Gillen has a district office, or Brian, all of us have district offices. Make yourself known. Stop in there. Talk to us. Let us know that you're out there. Building that, that personal connection 
makes a huge difference in the influence that you can have in a particular vote. Now, that works if you're a state senator, your state representative, or a township supervisor. With a U.S. senator or a congressman, perhaps not. But a quick story, last night I was at a fireman's banquet, and a representative of a, of a congressman who will remain unnamed said to me, you know, I said, boy, I bet your boss is at home relaxing. He said, yeah, I need to be relaxing too. He said, I hear the phone ringing in my dreams. <laughs> He said the fax machine ran out of paper. That's how many faxes that we were getting. So they were inundated and they responded to that, no doubt. But still, you know, there are other votes, there are other issues that will matter to you as well on the state and the local level. Try to make that connection and you may find how you can really be influential. Does that help a little bit, Rainy? Anything else I should add? Um. Something that I would suggest that I hope makes everyone uh, a lot more comfortable in their advocacy. I'm one of those legislators that likes the phone call and I like the person to be. I work for you, everybody in my district pays like a buck 87, I think, a year, and they're my boss, and you get to come in and spend time with me. But I, I will tell you something that I didn't know when I was an advocate, something that I didn't know when I was when I was doing grassroots lobbying. Um, I'm a data junkie, and I, I like that I'm full of numbers and I'm full of stats, and I always think that if I can prove to you mathematically something, then once it equals that, it just equals that. We're there. You should know. We're both the way I need you to. It never works that way. Um, there have been two major meta studies that have come out in the last five years. A meta study is a study of other studies that were done, I think, one by Pew and one by Quinnipiac. Um, and the first was about, um, about how people process information that is opposed to a belief system that they have. And it turns out the answer is a story. And it sounds really quaint, it sounds very simple that a story helps people change their mind. You've heard Senator Schweik say that a story is for her, that one of those key things that she looks for in a narrative when she's someone trying to sway her. And it turns out it's for lots of reasons, but essentially the brain, when it is given a story about somebody, it will inherently begin to relate to that person. The person no longer exists in the abstract, they actually exist right there in front of them. And once that person has been sort of materialized in their psyche, in their brain, it's a lot easier for that person to absorb the information that's coming from them. So first thing is a personal story is actually significantly more impactful than data. Um, when people go knock on doors for me who are supporting me as a candidate, I'll say, guys, if somebody asks you what I think about choice or what I, th I think about equal rights, don't tell them what I think. Tell them what you think and why you support me. It is actually going to do a better job of getting them to support me down the line. The other thing is how we deliver information. Um, you know that NPR voice, that very calm, melodic, kind of BBC thing that you can just have on in the background and makes you feel very comfortable? Well, it turns out it is both easy to listen to and easy to forget. That when your brain hears something like that, that very monotone, sort of that non-dramatic type of speech, it just processes it very easily. But when the human brain hears those little ums and uhs, and those, little, those little stammers, and, you know, those little colloquialisms that make us us, it has to lean in, it has to pay a little bit closer attention to process information when the person delivering that information isn't doing it so succinctly. And so it actually captures more of that information. And so the moral of the story is that to be the best advocate you can be, tell your personal story and just tell it the way that you would tell it to a person on the bus or to somebody at the kitchen table and you're actually doing it the most justice that you can. This isn't about ivory towers, this isn't about being so full of information that you have an answer to every single question. You'll always have answers about yourself, and that's the important part about leading with the story. I know we're talking largely about how to um, talk to legislators, but as an environmental activist, I have to say that it's very important as much as I don't think it's the most influential thing in the world, but I think it's still very important that when you receive those things in the email that say sign this letter, send this petition, that you do it. And, one, and there's one reason why, and I'll just give you a very quick personal story <laughs> about why. Um, we were going after the Department of Environmental Protection because they weren't giving us a hearing on a power plant here in Brooks County that we really, really wanted. And so, um, Jerry Knowles actually had received something from one of his constituents saying we're very concerned about this and 
we'd like to have this hearing. And so he sent a letter to the DEP, copied me, saying my fingerprints on it, I imagine. And so anyhow, they responded to him and they said, well, we didn't get enough signatures. We don't even know how many of those people were real people and came from a real place and actually exist. So I was able, because we used one of those little tools that we used to capture these things, I was able to go back to the organization that let me do it. And because I don't have any of that in grassroots, but I went to work with somebody. And I went to them and I said, can I get a spreadsheet? And they gave me the list of everybody's name. They didn't tell me what they said, but they gave me the list of everybody's name and address, identifying information, so they were from Berks County. And I took it to the outreach person for the DDP at the time, who now works for a pipeline company, which told you a lot about our Department of Environmental Protection. But anyway, I took it to her and I said, you tell me what name you can't read. And she said, I can read all of them. And I said, we'd like our hearing now. And so she did give us a meeting. She didn't give us the full hearing, but she gave us a meeting we weren't going to get otherwise. So it seems nonsense to do those things. They get inundated. I know they get stacked up. But it's actually important for people like us who are trying to represent your best interests when we're working as activists. And so make the call as well, but always sign those things. Thank you. Question in the back. Uh, hi, my name is Wendy Kinky. Um, watching construction in Washington and it's disgusting. And now I don't want to be that instructionist. How can you make the change without replaying that book and just shutting everything down and saying, how do we not be who they were? We all do it at Thanksgiving, we all do it at work, we all it's the funniest thing about politics, it somehow is the only place where we've lost the expectation that people can get along with people who disagree with them. Everywhere else in our lives, every place that you're all going to go to work on Monday and then I, you know, I'm going to walk down the street, I'm not going to pass people that didn't agree with me. We all do this everywhere else in our lives, except somehow we no longer expect this of our politicians. For 180 years, the job description of an elected official was you had to learn to get along with people who would potentially disagree with you. You couldn't just be a blind ideologue. And then 25, 35 years ago, our elected officials started telling us otherwise. No, 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 I'm, I'm doing a great job when I never get along with the other side. You can measure how much I care about how little I will ever work with somebody else. That is, it's, it's not the definition of our job description. Every single thing that we've talked about here, the path to it succeeding is a bipartisan path. There is no amount of liberal lefty self-righteousness that is ever going to make any of this stuff law. And the truth is, it's okay. Every single one of us is fully equipped with the skills to get along with people who, who we don't like or to get along with people who disagree with us. It, it's pretending that it, it is a unique skill set. It's pretending that it's something that's above and beyond most of us that has kept us, I think, from, from getting it. Yes, we have elected leadership, especially right now, that are rewarding rank and file members for not showing any type of, of um, bipartisanship or compassion towards the other side. But that, that, that sort of house of cards is falling very, very, very quickly. You know, we're not going to end with a, a fully liberal lefty Pennsylvania. What we're going to end with is a whole bunch of people just like us that have complicated ideologies about a whole bunch of things that don't fall wholly into one camp or another. It's part of the reason that we all should be in office instead of, this should be what the House floor looks like instead of what it looks like right now. Because it is something that is, it is a very readily available skill that most of us have. It's a tie Sorry about the soapbox. Remarks, but it's so critically important that we stop vilifying people who voted for Donald Trump by making assumptions about who they are. Um, you know, one of the things that's critically important for me to do the work that I do is that I can work across all ideological lines. Um, because, in fact, right now, in the next couple of days, the state of Maryland is going to ban fracking, and it was their Republican governor who came out two Fridays ago now and expressed his support and kind of actually pushed the Senate, the Democratic Senate, to get it done. In Florida, there is a ban bill coming uh, to the floor from Republicans. They're the ones who are sponsoring it. And so these assumptions that we make about who people are and how they think and how they vote, um, it also pertains to how we identify ourselves. We tend to think of ourselves in the boxes that they'd like to put us in, frankly. And as quickly and as effectively as we can get beyond that to recognize that maybe we can't talk about everything together, we don't agree on every issue for sure, but before we can find those places where we do agree, we are unstoppable. And so it's up to us to break down the barriers first and then expect that of everybody who's represented. I'd like to add something to that conversation too. I, um, you know, I run with a group of people
people who tend to think of themselves as progressive, I tend to think of myself as progressive on the whole. Um, Indivisible Works does not call itself a progressive organization. We have scrubbed that word from our website. We are interested in making democracy work, period. To us, to me, these are moral issues. It's about fairness. It's about it's about equal access to resources. It's whether people are treated with dignity and respect and, the, and get the care that they need. They're not, it, these are not partisan issues to me. Um, so yeah, I think that's, um, I, I think it's something that, that we need to learn and that, and that we are getting better at. I posted a story on Facebook this afternoon about a, a woman, I think she was in Los Angeles and she, she voted for Trump because she thought he would deport the bad hombres. Her husband is being deported. Um, and she's got a little buyer's remorse. But um, she wants to be. Just from the standpoint of, of getting anything done, as a legislator that's in the minority, there's only 16 of us that are Democrats in the Pennsylvania State Senate. I have to work with other people. That's the natural way I work anyhow. But I've been able to get a few bills passed. I always like to joke, and I've, I've said this before, it used to be that Democrats could only name roads, now it's down to park benches. <laughs> it's not that bad, really. If, if you can reach across the aisle, the bill that Erica was talking about, the hemp bill, the first thing that, you know, when they approached me about that, put our heads together and said, who would be a likely person of a different political party who would be willing to take this on and, and help us to move this bill forward? And, and the strategy works. The same thing happened with medical marijuana as well. In, in bills that I have been able to get done that even though they don't have my name on it, and they'll never have a fancy frame with a pen and a copy of the bill in it, it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is what we get done. And you know what? I have phantom frames on my wall. <laughs> the bills that I know I worked really hard on to help get them over the finish line. I'm there not because I have a seat or a desk. I'm there just as a transient, as a person who is a citizen who wanted to be active in helping to make our government better. I won't be there forever. That was not my and I feel that going forward with that attitude, and if all of us can kind of adopt that attitude of making sure that we listen, making sure that we try to understand somebody else's perspective, that's what will really make the difference. It really starts with us, too, because I'll add this as well. A lot of legislators really get to a, you know, the far ends of their, their party because they're afraid of getting primary. In other words, having somebody run against them in the primary that may even be further to the edge than they are. So what that has done has polarized us significantly. We need to get back to the middle, but it's going to be up to you, those of us and all of us, to make sure that you know we support those elected officials that do try to find a common ground. Thank you. Gentlemen, <laughs> uh, I just have a question. Uh, my name is uh, Martin. Latinos and, and how we can engage Latinos in this process because it affects Buffalo and I don't see us uh, getting involved in this type of, of events. So me as a Latino, I want to see what tools or what can I do to change that or do my part. That's a really, really good question. Um, it is my great regret that we have not yet been able to bring in more um, people of color and, um, and other minorities. I will say, and we're going to get to the activists in just a second, we have one of the leading advocates here, Ahan Jesus Marin from Make the Road Pennsylvania. He will be introducing himself and then you can go talk to him um, and other advocates um, after we do the questions. Okay, we have time for just a couple more. I think it was you. Um, my name is Yamana, and I, the only question I have is what educational level is needed to run for any office or to do anything in the political world? <laughs> There are doctors, there are high school grads, there are 
people that, that had to work and were never, you know, privileged enough to be able to graduate from high school. I promise you our legislature needs all of it. Um, in my experience, I've been, uh, there are, you know, I have colleagues that have terminal degrees in particular fields that are some days relevant to what they do. My degree is in international law. That's not relevant generally to being a state legislator. Uh, I think that the homogenization of academia and, and government is a part of the reason that we have this, um, that our big tent fell over. And so I think that one of the things that we desperately need right now is a, a lot more varied life experiences. And one of those very common life experiences is not having college degrees. Uh, I was going to say, I, I don't know how many of you guys have seen that meme going around the internet that's, that says, you wish I had the confidence of a mediocre white man. Um, <laughs> asking for like, the levels is, is uh, I, I think they're classic for a lot of us to be like, am, am I good enough for this seat? Can I do it? And, and Brian, it's, it's, it's all about your life experience. It's all about, we need a variety of experiences in the legislature. Um, because if we're talking about, you know, making access to college uh, a, a priority, people that all went to college just fine because their parents could pay for it or, or you know, whatever it is, like, they don't, they don't know the barriers to, to college, to, to getting to college or to getting through high school or things like that. We need people that understand that to be there. So if, uh, if we don't have those experiences, our, our legislature is worse off for it. So, no, there's no could I just clear yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could I just get back to the, the question about the Latinas and what um, a lot of people are paying attention to what is called the rising American electorate. And I believe it's by the year 2060 when white people will be the minority. Um, it is projected, I think, that the African American population will pretty much stay at the 13 to 14 percent that it currently is. Um, the Asian population will increase somewhat, but the Latino population is the burgeoning population. That is a critical part of the rise of the American electorate and, um, you know, in, in all of the issues that are going on and all of the hatred and all of the immigration issues, that can get lost in the future um, in American politics is going to, in many respects, be in the hands of Latinas in this country. There are 50 million Spanish speakers right now in the United States. 30 million of them were born in Spanish speaking countries and became citizens in the United States. That is an extremely powerful voting block. In my experience, dealing with Latino communities, they tend to be significantly better at having conversations within family, within community that a lot of sort of white suburban communities are really struggling to have. There is a disconnectedness that I see in, um, in a lot of white communities right now, especially as they, a lot of them are losing um, religion, which used to be a sort of a, a community thing that tied a lot of, of communities together. Um, I still see that in, in the Latino communities. Now, keep in mind, the legislature right now has, a, well, we just elected another Latino member to the, the legislature. So we now have two. Two. The legislature has 253 people. It's why we see English-only bills. It's why we see bills to deputize our state police so that they're like ICE officers. It's why we see all this sanctuary city stuff. We have zero in Zero? Right. Which is probably the hot, the, one of the hotbeds of the, the Latino population in the entire state. Yeah. Like I say, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably not going to make it. These bills would not come up with more Latino representation. We need to, um, to move on to our advocates. Are there any more um, questions? I just have a quick one. Um, there's been several comments about gerrymandering and uh, pervasive problems and causes, and I completely agree because you can't move the needle on any of these issues if you don't address that. It's a disproportionate of representation. But when I talk to different legislators and at different events, the kind of frame that I hear from them is well, yeah, you know. Of course we support gerrymandering, but guess what? We want the Supreme Court, and we're, it, it, the, court, the deck is stacked in our favor now, so you know we're not necessarily want to do anything about it until at least after the next election. But the pendulum always swings, and you know I think it's, it's cutting off your nose to support, to spite your face. <laughs> I'm curious your perspective on that, because I really do see kind of this pervasive attitude of, you know, we got the Supreme Court, we don't have to worry about this, for a long time, and I think that's a mistake. I think the senator might feel differently, but I, 
Um, HB 300, the state's non-discrimination law, was introduced 14 years ago, and it is still not law. And it wasn't the wrong time 14 years ago to introduce it, it was the time that we needed to build enough support for this. I think, is it SB 22 that is the, the gerrymandering bill, the Senate gerrymandering bill? Similarly, as more of these kinds of conversations have now, you all know a little bit more than you did before about gerrymandering and SB 22. And when you're picking who you'll vote for in the next election or when you're interacting with your senators and your House members, you can.